welcome to Varm Vlog, and today I'm with Carl Eugene Stroud, language teacher and anarchist militant, and we're going to be talking about education, particularly adult education and militancy. Um, I think, Carl, you've been involved in running a seminar that is based off of um, a program out of Rio de Janeiro run by social anarchists that, that I think you guys have mo modified and called Militant Kindergarten. Am I correct? Is that basically yeah, so, how it's going on? So Militant Kindergarten is like um, uh, the seminar around our, our sort of collective study of this, this text. And this text is a, a program that comes out of the Anarchist Federation of Rio de Janeiro and mm -hmm. specifically exploring uh, Especifismo, which is a strategy and uh, organizational methodology um, of anarchism coming out of Latin America. All right. And you've written a, a pamphlet actually kind of explaining that as well, um, that, that is available from, uh, available from Zambalaza books, <laughs> correct? Yes. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a pamphlet on there. Also other things that I've written can be found on uh, anarchismo.net. That's anarchismo with a K. Um, and um so yeah, another another pamphlet that I had written is uh, how do you say a specifismo in English, and it's specifically around like um, in order to do this study, it's required a lot of uh, multilingual uh, investigation and interaction with texts that are not in English, which is maybe like a normal uh, that, that kind of multilingual study is normal for other people that aren't uh, English speakers, but it can be a kind of um, huge obstacle for English speakers. And, and also part of that is maybe not always recognizing when they're, they're reading a translated text or they're um, really depending on translators to funnel information into English and make everything kind of uh, look a certain way to us. Yeah, this is actually a pretty big point. Um, you work in language education. I, I work in language education way back in my career. I used to work at a, at a university for for interpretation and translation. Um, and this is often true with left text and the hegemonic language or hegemonic language being English, because English speakers for, for reasons I think that actually we should probably have some patience with, because it's not their fault, uh, don't need to speak multiple languages because everybody already speaks theirs. Um, and it can even sometimes be a barrier to learning other languages because mo it's often easier for other people to accommodate you than for you than for them to deal with you speaking their language poorly. Um I think that that also goes for even just having things in more than one language uh, that, that are there in front of your face that like mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people who are part of that dominant language culture, they're not used to just multilingual interactions, even that, that things are are typically like kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to say whitewashed exactly, but they're cleaned and sterilized and filtered through something that makes it very palatable and easy to interact with. And I think yeah, a lot of people. I mean, obviously, if you speak English in some other part of the world, then you are not only speaking English. And so that that's also a relevant part of it is that multilingualism is actually like a, a facet of, of other people's daily lives. Correct. I mean, one thing that we have to always remember with English is English is spoken by more people as a as a secondary or tertiary or however much language than it is by people as a primary language. I mean, and there are many cultures that are held together, uh, particularly post-colonial cultures that that use their own forms of English that can seem very strange. But once you know the language that it's interacting with in a multilingual setting, the the English becomes pretty clear. I think of Nigerian English or Korean English, et cetera. There's just the, uh, Chinese English. There's a bunch. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think this is actually really important when dealing with some of these social texts because they are often more specific and not just in like the neologism rays that you're used to from French theory, uh, 
but also and like there's a lot of even like common language that's very specific in some of these it doesn't always translate to english well what well, didn't think we were going to be talking about this but it's actually really important and you know in my field which is like marxist studies this is actually a huge deal and you're dealing with a language that isn't even that different from english german but in which like a lot of the received translations or translation patterns are actually quite weird and were set a hundred years ago by kind of arbitrary decisions of of like victorian academics and they the and sometimes a more literal or direct translation actually makes something make a hell of a lot more sense. Um, I don't speak Portuguese, but I do speak ish Spanish. Um, and even discourse patterns, I think, are different. Like, you know, Spanish is a, some of the Spanish theoretical texts are much more recursive than, say, English or German ones. Um, and by that, I mean, they might go around the point longer and it's just English because we lose patience. Uh, I don't know the discourse patterns for Portuguese. I assume it's somewhat similar, but that's a big assumption. Well, um, so like uh, uh, when it comes to the Portuguese, that's that's not uh, not exactly my my domain. I speak French and uh, Spanish. And uh, so those are the I teach those languages. Sometimes I teach ESL. Um but but yeah, like I think that you you make a really good point there about like the way that theory is kind of interacted with in other languages, at least like, yeah, in my experience in French and Spanish, um, the precision on a, a kind of perfect word is not there. The, and, and what that does is it allows for a kind of um, theoretical discourse that is not so immediately um, ideologically debated about like, what is that term? And I don't like that. And I was thinking of this other words, so we must be part of different tendencies or um, that, that kind of uh, uh, wanting to have the perfect term, I think is, a, is an Anglophone practice. And that, that same emphasis is not expected in other, in other languages to the same degree. And again, I think that that actually is very related to multilingualism. Because if we think about people learning a, a second language, the idea that the, the discourse can be so perfectly precise is not really there anymore. That possibility is, is really shrink, it's, it's shrunken by like needing to um, uh, interact with English speakers from different places in the world even, right? Like we don't all have the same uh, standard vocabulary and connotation can be really triggering to Anglophones. That's, that's something I find. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, uh we're a Creole language um, and connotate we're, we are highly connotative and it's also, and I think I always have this uh, as a sympathy for my, for, I also sometimes teach ESL um, as a sympathy for my non-English speakers. Cause I'm like, and we're regionally highly connotative. So like standard English is fairly standard, but like, connotations are are still even in the age of internet mass media pretty highly localized so it's it's uh i don't envy people with this i've always told people in, english is a is a language i was always taught as a kid it was a very hard language i don't think that's true i think it's a pretty english easy language to learn enough it's a it's an incredibly difficult language to master and there's all kinds of class and social and ideological shades in every word choice that we pick um and i while that is true-ish in other like yes there's definitely class spanish and regional spanish oh my god is there regional spanish when you deal with latin america but um it's you're right it's not as fraught in the same way where we're trying to like find the exact word because this word indicates even if it means the same thing, like this long tendency debate that we've been having in English, so often that might be a hundred or 200 years old, like, um, and I think that's pretty alienating to, I mean, not just to multilingual people. I think it's alienating to, to like say non hyper educated English speakers. <laughs> so um, yeah, because it, it can be, like you said, it's very coded in a lot of different ways. So someone can even learn like certain aspects of those codes and not learn all of them and still be caught off guard by the things they say that are um, 
you know, not not the precise thing. And and again, even in an educated context or even in a, a leftist context where people are familiar with with uh, theoretical discourse, that can still be something that like someone has assumed they've learned um, really specific things to to speak about something and they have a hard time dealing with people who use a similar term or the same term uh, in a different way. I think that that's, that's a big part of what, uh, you know, Marxists have been doing with anarchism for more than a hundred years, right? It's just a lot of like, like um, once we, once we get into certain terms, not accepting where there could be divisions of interpretation or where there could be, um, uh, commonalities and instead kind of um, assuming all the divisions are in the words themselves, like in, in, in vocabulary specifically, not that they're not in language, but that they're in the specific vocabulary. Well, yeah, I, I think you're not just right to see it between Marxists and anarchists and like the way they approach, say, socialism or communism, but even between Marxist and Marxist and the way that they approach like the way they talk about strategic orientation or the specific definition they might give to imperialism or labor aristocracy. One of the weirdest things about my job is, uh, you know, the job that I've given myself actually. So it's not, it's not like my day job, but is going through and just explaining the historical evolutions of these terms. And like, guys, we've used this word in many different ways for a long time and you're actually blanketing over it in a way that makes it where you can't understand even our own theoretical text from like just 60 years ago because we have impugned whole new meanings on those words um and you know as a person whose mission it is to like get people to understand these these militant socialist texts uh not all of them are marxist right um I often find that it can come off as highly alienating when I'm like, hey, I know what you mean by class, but let's look at what this person means in this context in this way. And I sometimes wish I didn't have to do that. But, you know, there's a long tradition, of, for example, of Marx is just going all other definitions of class just aren't real, whatever the fuck that means about an abstract category. Um, and a lot of times I'm like, well, they're coherent. Like they're not talking about the same thing we are, but I know what they mean. Let's quit pretending that like, there's a platonic form of class that was found by Marx and put in capital and that all other forms are invalid because they don't use the same definitions. We know they don't use the same definitions. We can be grown ups about it and just point that out. But it's, you know, and I'm not saying there aren't Marxist, I mean, there are anarchist tendencies who do this. I'm sure I'm not as familiar with those milieus. Um, but I can tell you that, like, the our definition is the right definition thing is particular to Marxism, which is also particular to English speakers. And I do find that if you're reading, say, particularly Spanish or Italian um, Marxist texts, they aren't nearly so fussy. Um, so it's it, it's an interesting thing to note, you know, in addition to the normal problems of the hegemonic language, you have specific leftist subcultural issues that are blinding. And, you know, I, I like to one of the things I like to do and I do it be, not because I am a big proponent of leftist unity for any sake. I'm actually not. But I do think sometimes it's important for us to I will take uh, different positions held by anarchists, different kinds of Marxist tendencies and remove the tendency name of who said what and just point out that like some of these tendencies, for example, an anarchist and a Marxist Leninist and a whatever um, a Bordigist, whatever you pick, uh, um, a syndicalist, anarchist, etc. Um, might have different groups that are different, more different from each other on political questions than they are from people in other groups that would just automatically call them, you know, some kind of slur the moment they heard the, the, the you know, the term anarchist or Marxist Leninist or whatever. Um, 
which is not to say there aren't substantive difference between these positions, but a lot of the substantive differences, frankly, are so historical that I'm not always sure how relevant they are to contemporary struggle. You can disagree with me on that, but it's, it's, uh, you know, I could probably never have another debate about Kronstadt ever again in my life. Like it's not, again, not that it's not important to have your take to understand it historically, but like, We've been doing this for a hundred years. So well, and you know, that's that's actually I think um uh relates a lot to to a specifismo and to kind of um how this has been able to sort of get us uh it, out of out of these kinds of like you say, like repetitive debates. Cause from our perspective, like kind of what ends up happening is that everything is just interpreted as ideological dispute. So it's almost impossible to even have a strategic dispute because if you have a different strategy, people just assume like, oh, you're actually just part of some different school of thought. Okay, my bad. And that we we don't have space for for sort of disagreeing on those things. And that, yeah, like, you know, thinking about something like leftist unity, I think that from, from a specifismo perspective, like the idea with that is that the left is some kind of a grouping of tendency that makes sense in certain contexts, but that grouping those things together as part of a strategy is inherently ideolo ideologizing certain kinds of social level work that would need to be done. And that that, that kind of placing ideology inside of social movements is something that weakens social movements. It doesn't strengthen them. And so the strategy is all about um, deepening that ideology on the political level, but distinguishing that from social work that happens uh, in popular spaces. Mm. That, that's an important, important uh, point. I guess one thing I'm going to ask you is, you know, uh, you and I are both, I would say we're largely militant socialist educators, like to avoid any immediate sectarian difference between us um and on one hand right now i think there is a general and i would say specifically liberal overestimation of what education can accomplish in and of itself and on the other hand there is a militant tendency i think to overreact to that and pretend like education either isn't important are the only education that's important is like whatever their weird sectarian unit says. So why do you think these kind of issues are like, you know, you're starting a program on a specifismo and it's a particular, it's kind of particular, but I, you know, I looked at the text, she sent me much broader actually in a lot of ways view of say uh, social anarchism and socialism in general. Um, and yet you're also doing it in a context of like bringing in people who may not be familiar to like, say the militant left or the radical left milieu. How, how do you communicate that? Particularly when you're dealing with, like we've said, multilingual text, a lot of which are not translated into English. And I, I would tell people, even in a tradition that's, you know, is academically documented as Marxism, there are basic texts that are not translated into English. Like you have to read German or Spanish or Italian or Russian or something to even begin to touch. Yeah. Like uh, I think that, that, you know, thinking about what we were saying before with the vocabulary and the connotation, one thing that happened with us in the beginning of these studies was that um, we, we ran into this term in this text constantly of, of militancy and militant and that like as english speakers we're imme immediately like oh mi military like i don't know that sounds kind of bad or uh it, it's very hard for us to break out of um uh, activism and activist and like these term terms like that which are not the wrong terms for a certain kind of thing but also um what we were able to find as we investigated militancy more was that it really was a concept that was missing from North American uh, socialist struggle or even just uh, uh, social movements was that we, we really didn't think about militancy. We thought about activism and that 
it became obvious pretty quick that 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 emphasis on activism and complete absence of a concept of militancy was uh, part of the burnout cycle we were experiencing and part of how there wasn't any like there weren't any older people who could kind of teach us their experiences that 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 we sort of were left on our own to figure out how to educate ourselves and uh, not because we were children either. It's like, uh, even as adults, it's like, and even even entirely plugged into these uh, uh, radical spaces, it, it never became apparent who had experiences to be sharing. Um, everything sort of worked on a kind of assumed ideological unity that you couldn't really ever talk about because if the subject really came up, it would become divisive. And so that assumed I. Uh, ideological unity that works for a kind of activist action, a, a mobilization, but that doesn't work for uh, any sort of consistency of struggle and definitely not for the theoretical work of connecting instances to each other. And so militancy, just even as a term, was something we had to work with, actually, because we couldn't just uh, even understand really what that meant. And so right from the beginning, actually, what helped a lot was uh, working because because I hear this term all the time in in Spanish or in French that's just a normal term it just means like the person like uh, uh, promoting a certain idea or practice or something and so um, by relating it to the verb like to militate like um, militar in in Spanish that we were able to kind of understand what that maybe means differently in a way that like militar is like uh, like you militate for something and that you might not have to be a, an activist for something. You might just be able to be active when there's activity. And that that kind of explicitly having an ideological backing is, um, yeah, something that we were not used to needing to take up so explicitly. Because I think in anarchist spaces, that ideology, that political ideology is assumed it's covered by a kind of uh, morality or um, that, that the ethical values and, and uh, like, yeah, like humanistic perspective is enough to, to cover the ideological debate. Yeah. I, it, you admitting that actually cuts against one of my like lived experiences of dealing with anarchists where I'm like, you assume a united morality and uh, I don't think that's wise. <laughs> like, uh it might be, you're right, it might be rights for an organization or a particular militant action or an activist thing, but in general. And I also think, in a way, um, there's a whole lot that gets farmed out when you do that. Like, uh, by, by that I mean, like, okay, you assume that there's a shared morality and your, say, anarchist or Marxist group has a, a, a statement about that. Marxists are more likely to pretend they don't have a morality, which is its own special kind of frustration. <laughs> but uh, just, trust me, it really annoys me. Um, but it, it nonetheless, uh, you, you see both tendencies. But but what I find, like, for example, um, I believe in a lot of things that we would call human rights, but I don't ever use that language because I consider that language to be, I mean, literally enlightenment, liberal, bourgeois, like um, related to Christian tradition and natural law that we don't hold anymore, etc. cetera. Um, and I find that, you know, a lot of say socialist morality when it goes to reach for concepts and are explicitly already articulated in its particular sectarian concerns will just grab the liberal version of something and use it because it hasn't articulated its own form of X or Y. Or in, um, in the U S it'll just grab the like Christian puritanical version of that also. And so yeah, we, yes. we end up using just, uh, I mean, because because that's something else. Like I, I live in Olympia, Washington now, but I'm from I'm from Texas, from West Texas. And, uh, 
you know, I, my, my whole life when I was younger, like you, you're surrounded by evangelicals and you don't get to kind of take a passive stance to, to that all the time, because it, it actually like needs a, a sort of active rejection. If you're going to create any kind of values that aren't just those, and, and it, it doesn't even have to be a kind of, um, uh, you can't return to things, some things that might be common with that, but that like, uh, it's so pervasive that you you have to be active toward it. You can't just uh, assume, oh, I'm not a believer and that's enough, or oh, I, I reject those extremist ideas and that's enough. You know, I find that, for example, like in, uh, the north, the northeast of the United States is one of the least religious areas of the country, but it is thoroughly Protestant. And the way that it orients towards the world. I, I actually got in an argument with another anarchist recently who's like, oh, you're just condemning him as Puritan and that's lazy. I'm like, yeah, this would lazy when conservatives do it. But we have to admit that uh, and you must forgive me because I'm going to have to default to Marxist talk because that's how I know how to articulate these things. But that the social like the relations of production are actually formed, not just in a superstructural way but in a deep way by prior social um, conditioning. And in the United States, that's in, in most of the Anglo war, uh, Anglo speaking world, frankly, that is a condition that was defined by two or three particular types of Protestantism. And that justification in the way we think of ideology, even when we are generations out from having believers in our family, we still think that way in a lot of ways, the way we articulate this. And if you don't believe me, go to another capitalist culture that has a different prior uh, ideological form. Like when I was in South Korea, it was definitely Confucianism, right? Like a particular form of Confucianism at that. And watch how it, it kind of fills in the gaps of capitalist social relations and see how different it makes certain interactions. Um, and I think that's that's really important to understand. And you're right. Like, you do have to actively reject it. Like, I'm not, I wasn't raised Protestant at all. I'm from a, but I am also like you. I'm from Georgia. I'm from a very evangelical part of the country. Um, my, my family happens to be Catholics and Jews. But, like, I still know that there are certain ways that if I go on default, just in the way we use and I'm, I'm not a sapphire worthless. I don't believe language determines things this way. But even it is betrayed by the way we use language. There's a lot of like residual Christian Protestant wasp stuff, even in me, where it's not in my direct heritage or my religious experience, because I live in a culture that was defined by it. And that was the that was the religious hegemonic culture prior to capitalism and and concurrent with it. So it's still here. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I see, I definitely see a lot of the kind of self-righteousness come out. That's just a cultural self-righteousness. We don't think it's ideological, but like in, in, uh, I, I think it's easy for us in the U S to forget that, like, you know, most of the world's not Protestant. And yeah. so even the Christians in most of the world don't have the same kind of popular mainstream take that, that is common here. And, so like, again, like I think that that relates a lot to how kind of um, comfortable with our own, our own culture we can be and sort of just not challenged to have to mix that with other stuff that often. And yeah, in that sense, like Protestantism definitely fits in, in other American like practices that are very, uh, that, that reinforce that, you know, that, that kind of bias or that sort of um, discomfort with needing to deal with uh, plurality. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think even even the way, say, like we talk about virtue signaling to use something that the right talks too much about, but I think is real. Um, the way we signal virtue is very individualistic in a way that like if you're in, say, a Catholic, like a predominantly historically Catholic country, even if it has a lot of evangelicals in it now, uh, you don't see in the same way. <laughs> like, it's just not a thing you see. Um, and I, I do think this is actually really important when we come to things like um, just approaching, 
like social organization and text and, and, and whatnot that in a way that um, articulates these cultural differences without like essentializing them either. Like, like, Oh, well, you know, Mexicans are Catholic. So they're this way. Like, no, that's not really what I'm saying either. There's a whole, any culture is going to have like a ton of these things, not just the, pro, the dominant religious one. But the dominant religious one is super important. And there is a way, like, for example, if you're in Mexico, you could be a diehard a atheist, but you have to deal with the Virgin of Guadalupe. Like, and I don't. Like, it's not part of, like, it's not anywhere in my framework. I don't have to accept it or reject it. I'm going to take, you know, tamales on Christmas and Virgin of Guadalupe Day. It has no effect on me. But it's different in relation to your own culture. Um, I think this is the important thing about militancy, though. I, I wanted to talk to you about this. There was a turn away from militancy in both um, anarchist and communist rhetoric um, between, say, the 1960s and the 1990s. I'm thinking about Freddie Perlman's militancy, the the final stage of alienation, which we could argue whether or not that's a Marxist or anarchist text is one of those texts that actually kind of comes out of both. Um and I think that had to do with a very particular, um, this is thrown around too often as an explanation, but I think it's true here, new left formulation of militancy as kind of out of uh, cadres that were based off of like revolutionary cells in the 1920s, but were totally removed from that decontextually. And were highly alienating to people because they also required you to constantly speak in a different way and to talk in a way that that was both highly academic but also on a weird war footing. Um, and what I find interesting about going back to like to militate or you know look at this term and and say Spanish and French, those associations while there is a strong association with the military, it's there. It's and even in those other languages, um, it is it didn't it doesn't look like that. So there's not this whole conception of like the rigid sectarian, um, frankly weirdo that pretends they're in a terror cell in 1920 while they're on campuses in 1968 or 1975 that led to this rejection, right? Like it, it's just that history isn't there in that particular subculture. While there are student left subcultures in Latin America and it definitely is in France, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same, I don't know, feel to it. Like um, I, I wanted to, to know what you make of that. Like, like it does seem like you're, you're almost having to dig back into like a different languages conception of militancy to get it away from an association that it had had in say the U United States left from like maybe the mid sixties until like when you and I were kids, like. I, I think that, that um, maybe we're, we're needing to like, like I don't think we combat so much people's conception of, uh, militancy inside of the left. I think it, it is a lot more on, on a, a level, on a linguistic level of, of being English speakers. And mm -hmm. just the fact that like uh, people are, as much as they might be triggered by that term militancy, I think they're also kind of uh, uh, partial to the term activist and likewise organizer. And I think that in other countries, the term organizer is kind of alienating in a way that like uh, doesn't seem very relevant, seems especially like bureaucratic, and um, that when we talk about that in a specifismo, when we talk about uh, activism and militancy, the way the way that uh, I mean, again, like to think about the theory that would need to connect these instances, that not everyone needs to be a militant, and that it is a lot more important to be uh, like. Uh, cultivating the quality of the militants who are working for or, or who are doing the work for an organization and for the people in social movements to recognize that for movements to be successful, militancy needs to be a factor in that. But that that is even something that's like been important in our study. And like you, you said before, like 
we in the Milton kindergarten, we interact with people who uh, we often term it like radicalizing and radicalized people so that we're, we're looking for situations where these people come in contact with each other in learning environments, not uh, where where someone's uh, got a kind of fake uh, way of, of sharing what they know with someone else, but where we're, we're both genuinely part of a kind of collective study realized through that collectivity. And um, what that what that does is it it positions activists as uh, potential supporters of militancy, as potentially more active participants in social movements sometimes, but as also dependent on militants and kind of that idea that like we don't need to decide like uh, I'm a militant. We need to learn about what that is so that then we can make an educated decision about how much we want to commit to something. But without understanding that, what what is ended up happening and what we've, you know, related to uh, a burnout cycle that's very common in the U.S. And I mean, it might be common other places also. I'm not as, as sure about that. But like um, what, what that's a, largely related to is people not, um, you know, being able to to uh, return to things to learn in a way that's collective. And not being able to share that that learning in a way that actually empowers us to choose whether we want to militate, and instead we we literally tend to find ourselves militating and burning out. And the only way we sort of discover militancy is because some, like you said, some cadre uh, cornered off some some young people, uh, taught them their way to speak, and you almost have to learn about the larger scene through this like really tiny lens and that that kind of um sectarianism is definitely like a practice that a specifismo is is rejecting and that that that's yeah like not just being rejected like you know amongst anarchists but definitely amongst marxists as well amongst all all people involved in in social struggle a term we've used in the militant kindergarten to talk about this is also kind of like stationary where people have like a thing they're doing, but they get really attached to the station they're at. Mm. And what we, what we lose is the movement that like, we don't, we don't need to necessarily articulate the critiques of the individual stations, but being stuck in stations is not part of revolutionary uh, militancy. Moving through stations is, is what we mean to be doing cultivating that flow of militancy and not cornering militants and like uh, cornering people into becoming militants. That's just, a, that, that's actually some interesting and good points. I think there, you know, we talk about cadres. One of the, one of the ironies is this burnout cycle is they're also dependent on fairly alienated people um, who have a lot of leisure time. And, you know, that's why they have, since the 1960s, focused so much on students, because it's fairly alienated people. You normally are in your 20s. Um, you're pretty highly educated by definition of being there. So you have some skills or you wouldn't be there. And they don't have to skill you, which is also part of the problem. I, that's a big problem. Um, and and by, by that, I mean, like, we should be skilling each other. We shouldn't just be using people's skills in a way that just exhausts them. Um, and um, you can just see this trend where it's like, oh, well, you know, left. Um, it's not as true anymore, I will admit. But when I was a kid, you know, and, and when I was in college, even like you would just meet people like left isn't what you do in your 20s until you become a good Democrat because there's something to support you. Or if you really get edgy, you become a Republican. Um, and of course, that's 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 not a great model for anything like um, it's one limited to a very specific milieu. It's two. It, it's a rat race. And three, like you don't ever actually like build. Um, I think you saw this more in Marxist organizations, but like we had organizations that have the same damn leadership for like three generations. You know, because you're just going through cycles of these young people who were um, highly motivated. I used to call it the Children's Crusade. Um, and that's a big, big problem. 
I've become, you know, uh, one thing I have taken from a lot of communitarians and anarchists back into like talking about Marxism is like, no, we have to think about this as building functional internal communities to be able to keep people going, to educate them, to skill them, to help them immediately and long term, not just off the promise of revolution later, because we don't know that we're going to see that. And that's a gamble that over time actually is less and less logical for someone to engage in. Like, it's like, that's the re the only reason you're there. And you're looking at like, well, revolution is like on a hundred, 200 year timeline. I don't give a shit. Right. Like that's a problem. So um, that, I, I think that that relates a lot back to the, the organizational dualism of especifismo mm -hmm. and this idea that the ideological uh, political level can focus on those longer term things and that th that actually unburdens the social level to be able to focus on shorter term wins that actually do uh, improve people's situation and their awareness of the conditions of their struggle. That, so, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I think this is actually important because when I was re when I was reading your Operismo document, uh, I mean not Operismo, Especifismo uh, um, documents. Operismo is Italian and different. Um, uh, I was actually thinking, like, oh, this actually operates on principles that have been organically figured out by these um, Brazilian anarchists that look a lot like cybernetic theory about how like you build recursion in you have different parts of the group who have different responsibilities. Yes, you need ideological co and community cohesion, but those are at different levels than what you're doing like on a day-to-day -day basis or in specific action. Like, and one of the, the worst traits I think of, of rendering uh, politics down to either just an ideological position, which is the Marxist sectarian left or a moral position, which is a lot of the anarchist sectarian left, is like these other levels of necessary things. Um, you know, if you want a party, if you want a successful, you know, operations group, if you want any of this, you need a bunch of these things to be kind of developing in conversation with each other where you're not just trying to flatten out all these, like flatten out the, both the long and immediate time horizon into one thing. Um, but also like the different needs of your members, how to keep you from burning out. Um, you know, uh, how to make it so militants don't only talk to other militants. Cause I think yeah. like it's literally even just this idea that like every person, you know, you don't need to convert them or quit knowing them. And, and that I think people have that idea, like not just that, that necessarily uh, militants of an organization do, but I think people that aren't have that idea of what that would mean. It's like, yeah, I'm not, I can't commit to that because, you know, I do love my parents and they're never going to be anarchists or they're, they're never going to be for revolution or something like that. And yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to lay that at Marxist fault uh for some of that um i'm willing to take uh take one for the team here and i can actually tell you when you start seeing that in marxism um after the trauma of the second international falling apart the bolsheviks come out with their 21 um necessary necessary conditions and it kicks a lot of anarchists out of, of any related social movement but it even it's like eugene debs can't join the third the, the communist international so it immediately breaks uh, the the group but one of the things that's required is constant purging of people who are not militant enough and who not who do not hold to the 21 required steps uh and then you add to that in 1921 the adoption of a total faction ban well if that's your image of militancy which i always like to point out that's not what they did when they actually won in russia either that's all post that but if that's your your image of militancy that's that is a recipe for constantly having to cut out comrades, family, friends, uh, split, you know, over small stuff, over minor disagreements. Uh, um, and I think it creates a particularly fragile political grouping, actually, that tends to, over time, uh, necessarily become more and more authoritarian because 
you're you're literally kicking out a lot of a lot of the diversity and and thus a lot of the people in your group that would keep it in check and keep it keep it. there's like all kinds of reality checks and come in from having multiple stuff like that that you lose when you're constantly purging people and i do think that's built into a lot of people's notion of militancy and then probably even more important for english speakers particularly americans that's also built in the Protestant churches. So like um, those two things together, because, you know, you think of like the church militant, you think of the crazy sectarian, you know, Pentecostal weirdo who like yelled at you at school or something like, and I don't want to deal with that. Like, you know, personally, <laughs> I just don't like that's that that's not a vision of, of social inclusion that I think is, I think most people naturally recoil from that, like it, because it's it's alienating. You don't want to cut off everyone who has a disagreement with you. It also seems to posit that like politics is is only possible if you have total unity on everything, which is a ridiculous proposition. <laughs> um, it's a person who argues with people all day, and then I think on top of that, you you actually picked up on it. Uh, you didn't say it outright, but I think it's implied in a lot of what we talked about language. Militants speak in a way that often only militants understand them. Like, it could be opposed militants, but they know what you mean, where a lot of the other people around you are like, what the fuck is this guy saying? Like, like, like I don't understand. Like, what's the difference between the popular and united front again? Like, why am I supposed to care about who did what to whom in Spain? Like, um, why do I need to know the specific weirdo definition of imperialism to like do any, like, you, you know, um, I, I, these are all Marx's examples. I'm sure if I really thought about it, I could come up with anarchist ones, but like, um, I think that's also like, it makes you ineffective as a militant or an organizer or whatever. Um, I, I think it's interesting <laughs> We're talking about you were talking about things sounding bureaucratic. Activist to me is almost the same word as militant as far as like what its root means. But at this point, I associate it so thoroughly with NGOs that like it kind of makes me feel gross. Um and then organizer, you know, I I I work with a union, I'm a union rep, so I'm an organizer, but I, I often don't know what the hell people do when they say that like i'm like okay so what do you mean by <laughs> like i guess that's true for militant but if someone's militating for something i can at least look up what they're militating for if they're organizing i don't always know that i'm gonna know you know i'm organizing for the dsa yeah but what is it that you actually do like well and you know that's that even you know that that being able to look up what it is and like uh learn about it that that's a lot of what we're trying to do with with militant kindergarten is that militant kindergarten is not an, and the center for especificismo studies is not a, an arm of a political organization. Mm -hmm. That's important because it does have ideological elements. It is an anarchist uh, uh, organization. We are studying an anarchist text from an anarchist perspective, but we are not uh, the, 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 you know, the objectives of the organization is not to form militants for an organization, but to help people understand what is a specifismo, what is a spec, what is militancy from that perspective, what do a specifismo militants do, or can, how do they conceive of things, and then people can determine what they what their relationship to a specifismo is. They can determine what they how they can interact with other other uh, people who do maybe consider themselves as specifists and uh, people who who don't that 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 kind of um, being able to look it up and know and that it's also not just a kind of personal like opinion a personal opinion about politics that it's actually a collectively formed opinion connected to internationally articulated uh, positions and things like yeah established over time that that um that kind of transparency is um i mean yeah it takes it it takes away the possibility of a of a very manipulative political level organization but what it opens the political 
organization up to doing is staying relevant mm -hmm. by actually communicating with people. And that, that that's, the, that's the dialectic we're working with in Especifismo is between having these ideals and what's actually the real context. And the theory being that this thing that's able to actually make those ideals present in the real context instead of just uh, at, at a meeting or in a text or yeah, some, some uh, removed situation. Because I think that that's, that's part of it. It's not just that sectarianism is um, um, you know, problematic on a numbers level. It's problematic on a relevancy level that like there is no way if your organization or your practices are holed up in themselves that they are relevant to what's going on. Like you said, you need that feedback from what, what's happening in order to uh, have a critical, pers a self-critical perspective. If you don't have that, that practice, then you don't have a thing to be um, trying to um, be relevant to. Mm. That, that re even relevance becomes an ideological element. And that, that's, that's probably worst case scenario, right? Like, yeah. no, we're relevant because we have the best ideas. Yeah, we're relevant because we have the invariant position. We're relevant because we have the correct program, even though our program hasn't worked at what it said it does in like, you know, 100 years. Or we're but, relevant because we're the oldest thing and we've been around the longest. So we yeah, win. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're relevant because we have, you know, <laughs> a direct, this is where Catholic thinking, but like we have a direct line to the apostles of communism, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, we can all think of organizations that claim such things, you know. So, like, like one thing that that we found right in the beginning. So, so like, you know, um, we studied this text as a, just a kind of traditional study group, like just any leftist study group might be. And mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a pretty long, dense uh, theoretical text, which is yeah, not not easy anyway. But it's especially not easy for American English speakers. That's not a common thing we deal with, and so. Uh, we read it and people kind of, you know, came in and out of the study group week after week. And when we finished, we had a lot of other people involved and we just decided like, you know, a lot of people missed the beginning. This was dense. Let's start over. And we literally mm -hmm. just started over. And in doing that, we, you know, uh, deepened our understanding of the text, but also kind of started to establish uh, what became referred to as as kindergarten is this idea that like, um, kindergarten is obviously like a return to basics, right? Like, let's go back to the first lessons. But then it's also this idea that like, even after you are done with kindergarten, kindergarten didn't disappear, right? You went to first grade or second grade or whatever, but like kindergarten is still like a place in the school. Like it, it's still a place where new people show up and there's people there and, and materials for them to learn what is going on in kindergarten. And I think like uh, that's an important thing not to forget because that's exactly what had, was what what had always been typical in study circles here before was that we would study something and then before it's even done we're fighting this tendency to be like okay so what are we learning this for or like okay so are we going to do what this book says or and and it's it's hard kind of like you said to to engage with the theory and the methodology of a text and learn it and just learn it instead of uh, constantly asking this question like, okay, so are we part of this tendency we just read about now? Because that's what makes people unable to learn about things that, I don't know, opposing tendencies or uh, uh, read about, um, uh, I don't know, how, how capitalist businesses organize or what are, what are their motivations in things. Right. Because it's like, well, I'm an anti-capitalist. So if I ever learn about that, what if I became one of them or something, you know? Yeah, there's a there's a fear of contagion that I think I often find hilarious because I'm like, well, you know, some of the things that these businesses do, they do because they work and some of what they work for. We don't want to touch, but some of what they work for, we do like and often I feel like we're. <laughs> we're trying to reinvent the real just because like we don't want to say we took anything from prior organizations or like the way churches are organized or you know i remember the whole the left is not a church debate and i'm like no it isn't there's a whole lot of stuff churches do uh that if we could do them 
we'd have a much more robust left-wing movement. So, yeah, I mean, it's not a church, but so what? Like, um, and I think that sort of, that's important. Um, I often point out to people that, like, you know, yes, there's a long, comprehended history from cybernetics. That's my interest, and I uh, it overlaps with a specific most of what I've read from the stuff you sent me. Um, it's not quite the same. But what the people who really perfected cybernetics were like capitalists who were weirdly interested in Soviet theories um, and utilized them in capitalistic ways. And then one of those guys helped the Codornes in Chile organize an information system that actually seems to have worked um, that empowered uh, workers, not just in the, I think a lot of people think it's the computers. It, that's not it. It's actually just enabling people to get communication facilitated between workers groups in ways that decrease, decrease the dependence on bureaucratization. Um, and so workers groups could do things and get information much quicker. Uh, did it totally get rid of bureaucratization? No. And it also didn't help that the social Democrats didn't do it to the military. Uh, so, you know, when a military leader defected, they were able to uh, do what they do. But um, nonetheless, I think it's really important. But if you had some kind of vaguely like, well, this comes out of the business consulting world. I mean, and specifically in the case of Stanford Beer, that was literally his job. Um, you would have been DOA like on, like just immediately. Uh, I also think about that like, okay, so you do you think the Soviet Union shouldn't have used factories when it was not not that it should use factories the way it did. I have a lot of concerns about some of that, but like because that's a capitalist technology, that's dumb. Like so, you know, you know that that kind of reminds me. So, uh, like uh, one thing that also happens when you interact with with people in other parts of the world and other languages is that you encounter different problems of connotation. Oh, yeah. So uh, recently, uh, I kind of uh, encountered something interesting because in a like an early video trying to understand a lot of this because like. That's another thing is like in order to do these studies, one thing that came out of this, because these are translations, is this uh, producing secondary sources, not as a way of, you know, not needing to go to the main thing, but as a way of um, um, supplementing that to to produce these sources in English so that um, we're not always dependent on the phrasing from the, the translation or from the initial text, but we're able to actually articulate the same ideas into English uh, in an English text. And um, that in, in making those secondary sources, I made some videos that are just kind of like short introduction videos to Espacifismo, defining some terms from uh, social anarchism and organization. And uh, one of the slides in, in one of those little presentations is about technology and how like technology will be used by uh, workers to reduce working hours and um, uh, to provide what we need instead of like just produce profit for capitalists. And um, that that was taken uh, by, by French uh, viewers as being um, kind of a, um, like a fully automated luxury communist kind of a thing that like uh, technology was going to be the thing that brought that about. And it's totally that like in the US context, we as, as anarchists, we have to kind of sometimes explicitly nod to technology so that it's clear we're not the anarchists that are against civilization and uh, uh, attempting to go to some kind of a uh, proto so the, yeah, particularly, world. Particularly in Olympia. <laughs> Um, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah, you're not John Saracen, uh, Kevin Tucker, or um, Derek Jensen to, to have a whole spectrum of those guys, right. um, it, it, yes, it, it, yes, you do have to differentiate that. Whereas, like, um, I guess you have similar, I, I was actually. Uh, this is this is a related problem. I was thinking the other day about uh, Kohei Sito's uh, Marx and the Anthropocene, um, which uh, reading, uh, I know it talks about degrowth um, socialism, and I was like, huh, 
does degrowth socialism have the same connotation in German and Japanese? I know Sito knows English. This is not, but but I was still like, this book was originally written in Japanese, and we're having debate about it around books that are written in English, like uh, Half of Socialism or whatever. And from reading the book, I'm not sure he's arguing the same thing. And is this an issue of like the connotation is different? Um, or did he oversee that and know the term? And actually, that does change the way I read that book, um, depending on what the answer to that is. That's a, There's a lot of that. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, because also the menus are so different. Like, um, it's, it's just, you know, very clear that some of these things, like, you know... It, it's interesting because it probably doesn't come up in Spanish because there is kind of a Spanish version of primitivism, primitivism, but other than like Jacques Comet, I can't think of a French one actually. <laughs> so uh, it's, it, it's, it's kind of, that's an interesting problem. Um, and and, a, and a, like a, a very real present problem. Like you said, like, it's not like a, some kind of uh, online thing. Like that's a real uh, present uh, current that like uh, in in North America like we do have to um, at least in the anarchist world we have to distinguish ourselves from and so um, that's that's like uh, yeah it seemed totally normal to me but super stuck out to to them as being something uh, really really bizarre but you know s sort of related to that like one thing that, that another thing that came up like uh, with our early studies is in Especifismo, we talk about this organizational dualism and that um, uh, that that's we use the terms political level and social level to talk about these two axes of of uh, action and that we're um, in English, like, you know, we, we talked about this kind of um, uh, triggering uh, terms and vocabulary when English speakers read political level. And it, some of this has to do with the structure of sentences in English. We put that modifier political before level. So there's not a lot of understanding that of, a, of a sort of hierarchy of, um, of terms in a sentence where we see that political is modifying level. And that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, except that what happened is that in practice, people just read political level as politics. Mm. And it just is read as the same thing because we saw the word political first and political level becomes a term. And, and we see that I think happen a lot. We've encountered that a bunch in our, in our discussions, you know, um, something very common in, in anarchist organizing is mutual aid, but we don't tend to think about that being aid that's mutual we just tend yeah. to think about it as a term mutual yeah. aid mutual aid which which easily degenerates into charity if you don't understand the mutual part of it um right. and and that 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 is not a problem grammatically in french or spanish because those mm. modifiers come after and they need to agree with whatever the noun is they're modifying so it is very clear when you're talking about a thing modified by something else and or a kind of that thing. Whereas in English, whichever word comes first, we have a tendency to jump on that and really see the, the whole rest of the term through that first that first part of a term. Right, because the adjective is actually the, uh, well, the adverb, no, adjective, sometimes adverb. Um, the modifier usually in English is the actually distinct, the differentiating thing, not the noun most of the time like there are there are a few exceptions to that but you're right we see political level we're like well level is not that important political being the modifier is what's the like levels yeah uh and i think that's that's actually a, a key one another one i think is interesting is uh and i've dealt with this before what social means in different languages or even in english at different times like um we tend to think of social as you know as cultural maybe uh and not as just like you know although it still shows up in social class uh but that's one of the few times where that we ignore the first word and well and you know I, I think part of that is also something else that we talk about in a specifismo is uh like popular power 
mm -hmm. or popular protagonism. And that in English, it's not as common to use the term popular when we're talking about social things. We tend to use popular to talk about celebrities or something, trends, uh, marketing. And that when we use popular, uh, that's another term that, that uh, yeah, I guess in, in our theory, that's become important to, uh, I don't know if it's recover or to establish that in English, but to, to be able to talk about popular as a, as a modifier of the, the, the massiveness of social organizing that's necessary for uh, transforming society, for revolutionary rupture, that, that um, we can't be thinking, that, that when we think culturally, we need to recognize like how maybe um, maybe this is pretty common all over the world today, but like in American culture, like culture is subcultural and broken up into a lot of things. And that's pretty, pretty obvious to people, right? Everybody knows, like, I don't know, the other people at the coffee shop don't listen to the same music you do or whatever, right? Right. Yeah. It's just a given. But we don't recognize that, like, if we're confusing cultural with social or uh, cultural with popular, then we are um, we're thinking of something significantly smaller than we need to be actually conceiving of. That's actually a great point. I was actually thinking the only time where popular is older meaning really gets saved in in uh english is populism and that has a different set of connotations it might be problematic but like like that is where that you know that that's the only place where you really see it like yes we might say popular uprising but i i guess it's 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 so confused by the you know marketing and of popular um yeah, popular the, uprising is the point where Pepsi decides to make an ad about the uprising, or right? Yeah, it's <laughs> a bad idea. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's a lot of that. Um, some of that can be, some of that can be changed by translations. But like you said, with militant, the the connotations to the to the the two obvious translations that you could use for it in English, activist, which I think literally was a way to rebrand people away from militant because it it's at its root means the same thing um like to activate to militate uh there's a slight difference in connotation in english but there's a huge difference between the connotation of militant and activist but not between militate and activate which i think is which you know we can over you can overdo you know, like historical epistemology, but it does seem to like tell you something. Um, and then organizer, yeah, I think it's just I don't I don't actually don't think it's correct for what they're doing. Um, it, in so much that organizer still has meaning, it's actually more specific than militant. Like so, and also interestingly, an organizer. Uh, has the implication of a bureaucratic function even in English because it implies that you are organizing people as if they are objects. Um, whereas a militant does not necessarily imply any relationship of authority over other people in your group. It just means you are militating for that group. And, you know, like, I think that's, you know, the and these things are subtle and to some degree, maybe they're not super important, but there are times where I think they are. Um, and, you know, we talk about the tendency on the left for bureaucratization. I know I do. It's something I really worry about a lot. And uh, I can't help but think that, like, all the language that I see a lot of leftists use is, like, purely bureaucratic language. Um, and that, that, in a way, betrays a maybe un not even intentional orientation that they have developed because of the structures of... Actually, I would say even more than language, our legal structure. Um, so, you know, these are things that are important to deal with. Um, and when I was going through these texts, I, I actually found it very interesting to go back and rethink about these things and think about what it would mean to educate people and to make some of these things strange again. Like, that's one thing I will tell you. We talk about multilingual education in the beginning. I think this is another thing that's good. 
uh, when I when I was a when I lived outside of the United States, which I did for seven and a half eight years, um, one of the things I it, it did is it made my own language weird to me in ways that I had to recognize things about it that I had not before, uh, and. Not that I think, you know, I tend to disagree with a somewhat liberal assumption that if you change language, you actually fundamentally change the way people think. But I do think if you look at language, you will learn the way pay people the the way people think. Um, and so there's a whole lot that becomes kind of clear, even in like power relationships or specificity or all these things, the moment you start making these words weird by having to engage with them in a completely foreign context, i.e. the context of another language. Um, it's even that's... better if you're dealing with non-native speakers and they make you like make you start asking, like, why do you say that that way? And you're like, I got no fucking clue. Um, but yeah, go on. Yeah, I think that that uh, uh, that, that relates a lot to in, in English, like basically like English speakers, like um, we're, I think it's the same as, as white people, not maybe be needing to recognize white culture because it is the dominant culture. And what that allows people to do is not be aware of their engaging in a, a white dominant culture until they're actually faced with some other culture. And that I think that because English is this dominant thing globally, People all over the world that don't speak English as their first language are forced to learn things about their own language because of how they have to interact with English. And Absolutely. That, that even just that kind of confrontation, kind of like you said, like it's not English, it's not American English speakers fault or other English speakers in the world. It's not their fault that they're part of this dominant system, but it's also okay to, you know, make them deal with multilingual uh, texts or to look at something in another language that that yeah. will not break their eyes and it will, they will survive the situation that, that actually leaving and not knowing every single thing about what was said is okay. And, and uh, a normal humbling thing for people who are not native English speakers, I think. Right. And yeah. Oh yeah, that, that you know it's actually funny because there's there's another side to this that we have not hit on, but I think it's very true, is that when language isn't made strange for you, a lot of times you can we, we've talked about the specific ways we use language as alienating. There's other times where we use general language, and we don't realize. <laughs> Um, that we're not talking about the same thing because it's like disguised by using the same word. And if you really deal with that, if you're having to deal with that in an area of translation, I think you become hyper aware of, of those instances as well, like where there's like kind of a natural language vagueness that uh, you have to deal with. Um, there are in different, I will say this different languages, actually, you talk about French and Spanish, different languages deal with it differently. French literally has an academy that has to approve words, which is part of why I think French neologisms get so specific and weird. Um, because they're, you know, they have to go through the Academy Francaise and they can't show all this foreign influence. Um, and then Spanish is a lot more organic. It's a lot more like English in the way it handles that, but they're both different than English. Um, and I think that's really important to do because I think it's a way that will model for you dealing with people who think differently from you in your own language that you don't even notice. Um, and yeah, there's obvious forms of that race, gender. I mean, those are the big ones, but there's also regional differences. Uh, I would even say subclass differences. Like there are differences. Like we have to deal with like there's pretty big cultural differences within, say, the working class or any oppressed class, like um, that you have to kind of deal with. And if you're just assuming that away, that just because they seem nominally like you, uh, come to some abstract category and you don't look at it very deeply, you can make some very mistaken. Uh, assumptions that will really affect your ability to achieve your goals or to achieve political power uh, to free yourself from 
from some kind of oppressive structure, et cetera. Like it, it, it really is kind of important in some I, key ways. I think that, that that's also where like multilingualism and in this sense also uh, internationalism really, um, what I, what's the word? Like, uh, I mean, they, they require a kind of, a kind of theoretical understanding of what you're trying to do that can't be so based on the exact word. It can't be so based on exactly your ideological values because there, there will be a need to interact with other ideological values. And that, um, that kind of theoretical perspective is able to like, um, you know, it has been able for us in in our studies to inform our local context that like it's not just a sort of um, internationalism as a, a word to put on your list of, of principles or something. It, it really is this idea that like if you're able to to develop um, collective study, uh, collective and in this case, collective study of a text, right? Uh, for this uh, militant formation and with ethical practices that are are uh, related to an actual liberatory pedagogy, then what you start to produce is collective analysis. And that mm. that collective analysis is not just based on hot personal takes. It's based on like a tradition of other people's words also. And that intertextuality is extremely important for figuring out what is politics in uh, English in the U.S. today. That like, what what is revolutionary politics? It obviously can't be personal opinions about politics. And I think that like, it's it's taken us a really circuitous route to f to find how to start producing what would be political analysis, what would be political theory or political ideology that's relevant for our context. But we didn't do it by just digging deeper into a locality. We did it by having this dialogue between this international uh, current, which is uh, growing in relevancy to our local context through our study of it. And, mm. and it's not in a way that's like, I really like this idea. Let's pick it up. It's actually in studying it that we're able to um, produce analysis we could not have been um, uh, arriving at on our own. So like in addressing what are the difficulties of a text or why study a text, right? Like if you don't already have objectives for it, it's hard for people to engage in, in uh, uh, difficult learning, you know? That's, that's a big part of why people don't learn language is because they, they have this idea that they are not going to, I don't know, travel or they're not going to uh, uh, use that or something. That's, that's kind of what Americans always say about learning Spanish is why they would learn it is because it's useful. But the, uh, there's this sort of idea of like um, you're letting all that use be determined by something outside of yourself. There's not a kind of like, what would I use that thing for? And, mm. and in that sense, like, you know, um, these, these uh, personal opinions about politics are really limiting to what we can, what we can uh, do collectively. And I think that, that, uh, through our study, we've been able to actually like um, uh, be part of producing these new ideas that we we uh, um, were actually struggling to even understand in the beginning. And and not only are they more clear, but they are more locally relevant now. We've been able to refine them and uh, relate ourselves more to what's going on. Like the 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 necessity of being relevant with our ideas is no longer a, a sort of debate point. That that seems like a very obvious thing now. And I think in in um, in the U.S., what what we would say is that like a lot of our organizing is stuck in this middle space between social level and political level. And that we don't really know what we're to do with that. We have a very like ideological click that doesn't that, that knows it needs to get bigger, but doesn't know how to even talk amongst itself. And uh, so it, it won't get more political and and ideologically unified, and it won't get more popular either. And that kind of in a in a very concrete practical sense, what is specificismo is talking about is just picking a direction for that that. Uh, grouping or organization to be moving toward 
that, that staying where it's at is never going to be sufficient. That's a, that's a great point. Actually, there's a great bunch of points. One of the things I think about there is you made a great pitch for methodological, not just nominal internationalism. It's not just that we, uh, in fact, I often tell people like your position on what's going on in another country is frankly, generally not relevant. What is relevant is that you understand um, the situation in that country can speak to its relationship to the international world and can support people who ask you for support. But it, but in some degree, like, for example, you know, I was talking to someone about Peru or something and I was like, in some degree, our position on like what happens to Castillo is not relevant at all to what happens to Castillo. It's just not. Um, and that's not why you should learn this. Like it's, it's not so you can have some kind of grand political strategy that you can move with these leaders in other countries. It, it's, it's more about like one building solidarity, building bridges, but also really understanding the way the world interacts with each other and where these fracture points are and how that affects your own society, um, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's, that's actually a super important takeaway from what you're talking about. Um, another important takeaway is, uh, is uh, ideological unity and the discipline that comes from that tends to come from actually doing something together more than comes from like professed belief. That's also super important. I think like, like I have a lot more unity with people I work with, even if I don't agree with them on hardly anything. Um, and yes, that does mean in some cases you do have to pick who you work with carefully, but in a lot of times um, the ideological question is, it's just backwards. Like, it, like, like the, the assumption is the ideological unity comes first. And I'm like, I don't mean to tell people like that we should be like Democrats and Republicans, but it sure as fuck isn't true for Democrats and Republicans that ideological unity comes before whatever the, the, the unity around power, the unity around their project. Like, in fact, if trying to even figure out what their ideology is, is really fucking hard. Um, and so, you know, you know, yes, it is some generic form of liberalism in some broad sense, but that's, that's so broad that it's not particularly helpful. So I think those two points are great. Um, and I think they're good points to, to tie this up on. I, I, what um, If you were going to tell people to search out what you guys are doing, um, where would you tell them to start? Um, you can check out our website, which is especifismostudies.org. And um, yeah, like the, the kindergarten, the, I mean, a big part of that is that Militant Kindergarten is an annual project that we mean to be maintaining. So we do mean to go back to kindergarten because kind of the last meaning of that is that like kindergarten teachers uh, think about kindergarten every year and like not in a way that's old, but in a way they're willing to refresh and like re-engage with. And so we also mean for kindergarten not to be just a, you know, oh, I, I learned it, that, that it is there for people to come and learn and, and complete and know and go do whatever with, but that it's also there for people who want to engage and militate for other people to still have that station to go to. So we kind of think about it like um, if, if the text, which is dense to read, is like a, like a you know, a, a shelter out in the woods somewhere and it's really far away and there's useful stuff there, but we can't take everybody. People have to take themselves there. We can help whoever's willing to make the effort get there and we will make sure that we all leave together and come back together. But we have to do part of that work on our own. We can't, we can't carry a whole person there. And what that means is that um, by, by being present in our, in our collective effort, you are factored into what, what needs to happen. Like your needs are, are part of what's being addressed, but it's not going to be easy just because of that. There's not some magic way to dumb all this down to make it not really hard and not something that we study forever. Like a major thing about this, you know, uh, from an educational perspective is that like, 
uh, kind of expropriating our skills that we get from universities and uh, things like that. And that's a big thing that I've been able to do is that uh, I, I can study a text for a long time. So, I mean, a lot of what, what's been able, like what, what's allowed us to have this kindergarten is like studying the same text for so many years and not needing to be dogmatic about it. And I think a lot of that has to do with studying it in a context that's pedagogically uh, oriented. It's it's related to education. And this idea that like uh, educational militancy is something that as educators, we don't question, right? If you're put in a situation with people learning, uh, your ethical dilemmas are uh, a lot more clear. And, and the the amount of effort you'll put into defending that is is pretty high and i think that's something i kind of realized about myself as an educator but that when we start doing these things collectively other people realize too in this way that like uh it's not a lip service to say you know we're all teachers and all students that like there are ways where we can create environments where that happens and there's also ways we can create environments where we take turns doing that and it doesn't have to be um, uh, that you needed to know everything before you came into that space, that there, there is space for new people to open up uh, perspectives that we couldn't see otherwise. And that is exactly why we want the political level to have contact with the social level, why we would want radicalized people to have contact with radicalizing people. Yeah, that makes, that's actually great. Um... It's also a way to like, as a teacher, something I think about is reduce dependency on the teacher because if the teacher is part of the, of like the, the zone of proximal development to use Vygotsky talk, um, good old Soviet education talk, um, then there's a, expertise is still important. Um, but it is not hierarchized in the same way. And also it, it becomes less frail. Like I just tell people like you think of teachers that you have who've refused to change their teaching about something from when they started in like 1992 or 1985, you know, like uh, those classes are like worksheets. They're, they suck. Um, they're not very effective either. Um, unless even if they're a super dynamic lecturer, if they've been giving the same lecture for 35 years, you, you know that there's a problem. <laughs> like, and, and it also, I think it's good for both sides, like you said, in that sense. And you know, it's funny because people would laugh at this in terms of politics, but the moment I actually be like, think of it like your experience of a classroom, <laughs> it becomes a, a much clearer dynamic of what you need to do um and i really i really think that's uh that's great um i think that there's a you know there's a class line that a teacher is kind of always positioned on right mm -hmm. and in that way like um it it really relates to this idea of uh, engaging with people uh who maybe have different motivations in struggle and that like uh, just being a teacher doesn't put you on the side of, of students. No, absolutely. It does not. <laughs> but being a teacher, it puts you in the position to figure out how to be on the side of students. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's that, a choice that you line, can make. you're on. And like, I, I think that, you know, there's a very much a, an idea that like we, we need teachers, but that um, it's not because we need like uh, the authorities to be teaching us the thing. We need the people who are, will engage with the line explicitly and who are willing to take on the the ethical implications of of messing that up, right? Because yeah. I think that's not nothing, and that's definitely overlooked by by people who don't don't work in education or again like militants who are not militating for education. That's a great actually that is a a great point to end on, and I I definitely agree with that. I think a lot about. Um, what you've said tonight actually is something I think a lot about, um, like creating groups that educate themselves, making sure there's always opening levels for people to start making sure that they're, I, I think one of the, I think one of the challenges and maybe it's something that can be 
uh, that you can be creative about is you're right. Kindergarten teachers build up expertise in kindergarten teaching. You can't hand them a group of 12th graders and they, and they do it uh, easily. Uh, but I do sometimes wonder, I, I do think a lot about this. Is if a group like this gives you the power to every now and then be like, okay, now you got to go through a 304 course and take a year away from this and then come back with more expertise and stuff like that. Because the other thing that group education like this does is it deprioritizes having one person as a state uh, official in that spot, literal spot to, to do the job. Um, and I think that's also super important, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much here to talk about and I think you've done a good job talking about it. I'm going to link uh, all the stuff you mentioned in the show notes. Um, and so people can check this out. And I, and I will I will say, you know, uh, I'm a Marxist. Our relationship to anarchism is always what it is, which is complicated. Um, it ranges from comrades who we have a different time scale about to uh, accusing each other of being in the CIA. Um, a fun pastime. Um, a lot of people spend a whole lot of time doing it. Um, and I think it's interesting um, that something like this is actually useful regardless of, you know, yes, it comes from an anarchist position. Yes, it is an anarchist text. But <coughs> I think I agree with like like 95% of what I've read so far. <laughs> like, So it's like, it's like, well, yeah, it is. But there's a lot of ways that that we could utilize this just in like socialist militancy in general. Um, and it would enable us to work with different groups and ideologies, um, as long as they're not utterly reactionary um, in their stated ideology. Um, in a way that's that's useful and productive as opposed to the you know the self-righteous signification that we often see in all of our ideological milieus it is so fucking alienating to anyone who's not in it like, yeah it's it's like uh i mean in in that sense like i said before like unburdening the social level and burdening those social movements of the ideological disputes like just having those on our own before we go to those social spaces could really streamline like working together people might actually know oh we should work with them we shouldn't work with them we should work with them on these things and not on these other things and we don't right. have to figure that out in the social space i think that that uh all kinds of different uh revolutionary and socialist currents and tendencies in the u.s and maybe in other places too are are very bad at that and that we don't have to pollute the the social level with our ideology that we want ideology in social movements we don't want social movements in ideology that's that's the really important distinction there and it's it's also like you know i think that when it comes to like your your show or i've seen i've seen a growing uh, interest in this you you had the stp people on recently mm -hmm. and um uh, yeah i think that that there is a growing international tendency to learn that that, that that this is becoming its own kind of thing where we're able to see um you know relationships or commonalities in the practice of what we're doing and all of those aspects you mentioned like leaving it leaving space open for new people to show up and like uh, mm -hmm. not not holding ourselves away with only the most experienced people who already speak a certain lingo and yeah yeah, that's all super important. Um, and uh, conversely, I, I think maybe also teaching people it's okay to feel weird when you encounter certain lingo. Um, because, you know, I, there is a, another tendency. I, we haven't talked about it, but this tendency to also patronize the shit out of everybody. Um, but like, I'm going to talk to them like a worker who I assume is illiterate. Or I'm always going to dumb down like this really hard text because it's hard to, to read. And it's like, you know, people could also learn how to read hard stuff. And yes. maybe, maybe we do it slowly. Maybe we, maybe we learn new methods because we're doing it so slowly. And, and 
Absolutely. Being afraid of that is such a problem that, yeah, like goes back to, like you said, a methodological emphasis on, on internationalism and, and maybe even into like the methodological interest in collective study instead of just uh, learn the content and take it out and go back to activism. It's like, maybe we need to actually work on, on how we're doing that. That, that, exactly. that might be part of what we're working on too. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, I would say methodological study right now is the only way you're going to avoid general illiteracy. <laughs> so like, uh, and by that, I mean, like, um, our entire society right now is geared towards, and I'm going to almost sound like Jonathan Haidt or some conservative or something, but I think it's true geared towards commodified interaction of very brief seconds that are meant to tie you in to sell you stuff. And, uh, the best way to get through that isn't I'm a superhuman with super discipline and I can undo the executive function problems of that everybody else has through my sheer will because good fucking luck guy. Like um, I always talk about this in terms of generational problems, but I'm also like, yeah, but even like baby boomers, the moment you gave them a computer, they got stupid. So the, the, the issue here actually is like, what social supports can you do? You're more likely to do the work if there's people who you need to engage with. And you're more likely to stretch it out because you're going to talk about it and integrate it. And it, you're going to have a reason to like jog that part of your executive function. And you're more likely to learn it. You know how, you know, just to, you know, I'm a very educated person. I feel like people can tell i can lord it over people if i want to but do you know how much stuff i have to teach myself to be able to do this it's actually i do it partly for me because otherwise my 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 uh my reason to learn and process and like make it articulatable just isn't always there like it's like oh if i'm just doing this for me like who cares like i, I can i think it can sometimes be it can sometimes seem a little uh dishonest when i say it but at the kindergarten sessions sometimes i feel like i learn the most and it's a little unfair to new people because it's like like i'm able to use so much of their questions to learn so much that like uh, uh yeah, it sometimes seems a little a little uh, imbalanced because, like, uh, by by interacting with new people, uh, my perspective is so ref like freshened up and like uh, renovated that, um, and and because I I've done that, I've been reading this text for for years already. I have like very specific problems that I get really stuck in and can't kind of get out and that fresh perspective is so helpful to me that sometimes, yeah, like it, it can seem almost one-sided because like all of their investigating new curiosities just totally opens up new paths for me to understand larger aspects of the text. And yeah, it's like I said, like it can sometimes maybe seem not, not, uh, not true, but it's definitely like the way I feel sometimes is like uh, I get so much out of interacting with everybody. Yeah. I think, you know, same with with this discussion right now is that, like, um, we have to remember conversation is improvised and like, yes, it's scripted. We're, we're making this up. And that means we're going places we weren't ready for. And that's that's actually like a super important part of thinking is not just having the ironed out, polished part of thinking, but the shooting off the hip, you know, like not knowing where we're going. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I was actually thinking about this the other day. I, I don't write a lot of articles. I, I'm working on a book, but I, I generally, I I do, you know, I don't love Derrida. And for those of you who don't get why I said that, I, I think one thing that Derrida did point out, though, is this over-reliance on textuality for seriousness of learning, uh, because conversations seem pretty ephemeral. Um, but the dialogue super important. I do not like, I can have a dialogue with a book, but that dialogue is not going to generally speaking, unless the author's still alive and can literally hear what I'm saying um, is, is not going to lead me in any like two way street about how to develop my concepts, how to change my approach to people, how to, um, and so I've been a big proponent 
uh, both thinking out loud and getting stuff wrong and admitting it, super important, and also uh, and taking the responsibility for that. But also, like, going through these conversations and sometimes finding people that you share, like, 60% of a worldview with, because I don't think performative debating is all that useful. But the the 40% of contestation is where a whole lot of stuff can come out uh, that you're not, that you might not have even known that you know, or maybe have had to, like, like integrate on the fly and then it sticks with you because it becomes some you've scaffolded it to to use education speak for a second you've scaffolded onto some other concept or experience that's meaningful and now you have this in your toolkit to scaffold more stuff on the dialogue is super important for that and as a teacher you know it's my day job uh it's i do feel that way like like for example there are books that i teach that i thought i hated um that you know there are a few i still hate that there's going to be no amount of how many times i teach them that they they don't bug me but like that i've grown with because i've taught them because i've gotten so many different perspectives over the, of them over the course of 10 15 years and when when people used to say oh well i learn as much as my students do i used to tell them they were full of shit and now i'm like no they you probably do actually. And if you don't, maybe you're not paying attention. It's not that you don't have the responsibility and authority to like be accountable for knowing stuff, but like you can't do it on your own and knowledge isn't something you just implant in someone's head. Um, and they just use it. Like you can download it. And, uh, and when it comes to like social activist knowledge, that's even more true because even if what you're, what you learned is like perfect for a milieu that you were in when you were 25. Uh, material conditions constantly change. So like, like you it's know, just, that, you know, not that's, an important, it for that's an important part of like our contemporary lives too, is that like, we don't, not, not only does like that change as we age, but like we don't live in the same places our whole lives. No. And it becomes a really complicated thing to interact like in in social movements if you're really dependent on a, a like strict understanding of how how that works or how, what your place is in that. Uh, because as you physically just change towns, that's not going to work anymore. That's not going to be relevant. And so I think that that's also something that we mean for the Center for Especifismo Studies to function as over time is that uh we we do also have like a uh, session sometimes like uh in our locale where where a lot of us are based in in washington and you know maybe as we go forward that might be something that happens in other places too but most of our meetings are online specifically because um the the likelihood of getting a concentration of people together in a locale that are going to do this collective study is a lot lower and kind of like you were saying before, the idea that, oh, we need to get the ideological unity first and then we can do everything. That's going to not happen if we also need to learn. And, and we need to kind of have that learning space, not be so attached to these changing social milieus that we're a part of. And in that way, like I think the digital aspect of this pedagogy is also really relevant because something that that like young people deal with is that they move all the time. But like another thing that's happened with a kind of, you know, uh, precarization of, of other people in society is that that's that fact starts to last longer and longer into people's lives. And uh, to the point where I'm not sure that anyone even dreams of living in the same place their whole life, that that sort of isn't even what people are thinking of. And so actually being able to respond to that uh in a way that's going to be able to address that over time, I think is important so that we're not establishing a, a educational practices that need a perfect recipe of people who are there right now. Because I think that's another thing that, that affects student organizing, right? Which is usually where like learning is considered something that's like a high priority, but, but student organizing cycles through people. And um, you know, necessarily like, too. Like there, there would right. be a better way to do it where you're going to have people in the same area for like 10 or 20 years because most people move away to go to college. So, 
but that but that that very much relates to adult education and this mm -hmm. idea that like and and again like to multilingualism is that like you don't need to wait until you move to Mexico to start learning and interacting with Spanish. You can do oh, that on a yeah. daily basis right now already. And everything you know is also available on Spanish on the internet. The internet's just that much bigger in the topics you're already interested in. And then all the stuff that you've never learned that you've been meaning to is also there in Spanish. And you could do that. And this idea that like, we need to um, physically go be places, I think is, is um, uh, not totally wrong, but it's also uh, it becomes an excuse. And yeah. if we use our learnings, if we use online for learning, I think that that's a, a, you know, a really important way to get us one off the internet at some point, but also to like, uh, to not just think the internet's a place for personal opinions and hot takes, that it is a place for collective work and, and actual political organizing. That's not like, uh, no, this isn't the political organizing. Like you said, this isn't a kind of educationalism where if we just teach people the stuff, then that's going to fix the problems. But this is an aspect of that larger dilemma. Yeah. That's again, another great point. I, <laughs> I think about a, an argument I once had with someone, uh, a, a fairly famous leftist who was very highly educated and went off about how you had to like move to Germany to speak German. And I was like, it's true that to understand German as it's contemporarily used, uh, that it really helps to go live in Germany for a little while. But I was like, but it's not necessary, particularly when you're dealing with historical texts, because that's German's not German, it's in common use now anyway. Um, and I really pissed him off for some reason. And then I, I think I pointed out, I'm like, you also make this like an unattainable class thing because unless you have lucky enough to have a job like I did, uh, that carts you around the world, international travel is a sign of being bougie as fuck. So <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but you know, particularly with Spanish, like. I live in a, in a in a neighborhood where you're mo you're just as likely to hear Spanish as English, and not like I try to make myself use it because uh, um, otherwise I'll lose it. Um, that's another thing with language; you need to use it, or it gets real stagnant. Um, I've gotten to the point now with German where I can read it, but I I don't think I can speak it anymore, or at least not like not without sounding like a American that doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, and that was not true, but, but, but I can still interact with, with German text and I still do that on the, on a, and it's still useful for me. Um, and I point that out just so like, it was like, well, you know, you lost it. I'm like, well, you lose parts of it. True. But th there's parts of it I need. And I also can tell you that if I was to like, say, hang out with German, a, a German speaker, it'd probably come back in a couple of months. Um, so, you know, all about, you know, I think people should embrace multilingualism as much as possible. Um, I always feel real, you know, I live in Utah where there's a lot of multilingual people because of the Mormon thing. But um, I always feel real strange when I'm like, when I'm like, Americans are so impressed because I like have a cursory elementary understanding of like four languages. And then I'm like, yeah, but like everyone I knew in Asia like spoke like six. Like, you know, um, and, and they all had to speak English because, good God, if you didn't speak whatever the local language is, you better speak English. Like, you know, it's just, it, it's just, you know, what we find impressive because it's an act of will. It's like de rigueur for even working class people in other parts of the world. So, right. and, and that's why, like, it's not that that's another point that's good to make about why it's not okay to make it about travel and about some kind of class thing is that like working class people learn English all over the world. And yeah. And that, 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 that I think also relates a lot to this, like I was saying, like tendency to learn and like that, that a big part of this is that if if these texts are hard, they're going to be hard for everybody, but they're especially going to be hard for working class people who don't have time. And uh, that's like a thing we're doing at night. So if if it's like if if learning, if, if militant education and militant formation is something we think is important, 
it also is something we're going to have to see as an inherently being like inconvenient and like an extra thing to figure out where we can put it and something that's going to challenge us, not just mentally, but like uh, even just with our time and our energy. And so we will need uh, support to do that. And um, yeah, like it, it, learning a language can be so alienating because people can just be quick to be impressed and then not very quick to understand all the challenges that go with trying to maintain oh, that yeah. or something. And yeah, like that, that I think like, you know, uh, in, in the US, we tend to just kind of want to show monolingual people that we're multilingual and that that's, and then that when people are thinking of learning a language that that tends to be sort of the goal is like, I'll be able to show people that I speak that language, not thinking that everyone that they know that only speaks English has no idea. And that anyone that's impressed by that is not a speaker who will be impressed by the content of your your conversation in this other language. And no, yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, uh, one more thing to add to this, and then I really am going to wrap this up. But I think that's a great point. And one of the one of the the hardest things for me as an English speaker was moving to rural Korea, specifically rural Korea, because there weren't English speakers there. And having to remind myself what it's like to not have verbal facility, like to basically be a four-year-old in the language that you are learning, um, because it really makes you rethink your conceptions of intelligence um, and how you express that and how you show it and the way people express it to you. Um, and I think that's super important for like not treating people who aren't necessarily educatedly articulate, like they're stupid. Um, and it really helps if you've gone through it. Um, and especially recently, yeah, yeah, the, exactly. the, more, the more recent that is, the, the <laughs> more exercised your humility is. Cause it's right. like, oh, if you did that this morning, probably you're not that full of yourself this afternoon. Right. Oh yeah. When you're like, I couldn't figure out how to ask for for an apple um <laughs> or i figured out a swear word by accident um and yeah, maybe really, maybe my intelligence is more relative than i thought <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly um so yeah it's it's very important to do so thank you for for coming on i think these are issues that are both important and yet woefully under discussed anywhere and and like left milieus in English. And so I really appreciate it. And like I said earlier, I'm going to put all that in the show notes. Have a good, have a good day, Carl. Thank you for coming on. Thanks.